right, that's the song. The number is 156. Please take up a hymnal, turn to that song, 156. Please stand, uh, sing along as Brother Bob comes to lead it. There is no name in earth and the heaven above that we should give such honor and such love as the blessed name. Let us all acclaim that wondrous, glorious name of Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And he's just the same as his lovely name. And that's the reason why I love him so. Oh, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And someday I shall see him face to face to thank and praise him for his wondrous grace. When she gave to me, when he made me free, the blessed Son of God called Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same as his lovely name, and that's the reason why I love him so. Yes, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Please remain standing for morning prayer. Well, the pastor's away, but we're carrying on nevertheless. No, we're not carrying on. So please remain uh, calm. Be good. Well, we're going to continue as if he were already here. Uh, He's going to have a good day where he is down south. We're going to have a good day here. The Lord's going to bless. He has already, as his, his want to do. He wants to be a blessing to you. He wants you to learn from his word. He wants you to live a better life than you have in the past. And we're going to talk about all those things this morning. Expecting God to bless. If you ask him to it, he'll do it. Bow with me as I open in prayer. Father, you're a great God. I, I'm pleased to stand before these people, not because of who I am, but because of who you are. I'm representing you. I'm standing in your stead. I'm putting uh, some voice behind your words, and I pray, Father, that they will indeed be your words, that they will fall in receptive ears, that the people will hear, will, will hear be edified in their faith. They will be drawn closer to you, look to you more often with expectation of blessing. And so, Father, that's what I'm doing this morning. I'm going to ask you the same thing tonight. But you're God to hear us and answer for prayer, and you delight to do what we ask you to do if it's according to your will. And I know it's your will that this church would be blessed this morning, that your word would be preached faithfully, and that your people would respond. So, Father, help us to do that. Receive our thanksgiving and our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Song number one. Good to see everybody smile. Oh, let me shut the door.
Take your hymnals once again, please, and turn to hymn number 221, A Child of the King. And would you stand, please, together, let us sing all four verses of hymn number 221. My father is rich in houses and lands. Behold the wealth of the world in his hands. Of rubies and diamonds of silver and gold, his coffers are full. He has riches untold. I'm a child of the King, a child of the King, with Jesus my Savior. I'm a child of the King. My Father's own Son, the Savior of men, once wandered on earth as the poorest of them. But now he is pleading our pardon on high that we may be his when he comes by and by. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king with Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. I once was an outcast stranger on earth, a sinner by choice and an alien by birth, but I've been adopted, my name's written down. An heir to a mansion, a robe and a crown. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the king. A tent or a cottage, why should I care? They're building a palace for me over there. Though exiled from home, yet still I may sing. Oh, glory to God, I'm a child of the King. I'm a child of the King. A child of the King, with Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. Thank you, and please remain seated. The men are coming down front with a visitor's packet, so if this is your first time here at, uh, or a first time in a long time, uh, at Calvary Independent Baptist Church, uh, please uh, raise your hand, uh, keep them up, and they'll give you one of these visitor's packets. Fill out the card in it, put it in a plate, keep the pen for your own souvenir, reminder of when you've been here. Anybody like that? First time visitors, raise the hand. Okay, just home folks, that's well, that's well. I want to call your attention to a, well, actually, all the main items in the bulletin. So if you have a bulletin, please open it up and follow along as I point these things out to you. You might say, well, why do you point these things out on the bulletin? Why do we take the time each Sunday? Sometimes we say at the beginning of Sunday school class, then here we do it in the main service. Why do you do that? We can read. Well, that's true. You can read, and that's well. You ought to read. Read the bulletin. But it's been the experience of churches through the ages that people don't read the bulletin. And so we want you to know about these things, and so we, we take the time, call them to your attention, so that you might know uh, and might act on them. The first one is about the Senior Saints trip. Uh, there's been a lot of preparation, a lot of signing up. We've already, it's already been decided who's going to go. 
Uh, money's been paid and tickets have been bought. But nevertheless, uh, the trip is on July 19th. That's not too far away. This coming, what, Friday, I think it is. And the bus will leave the church at 10.30 in the morning, 10.30 a.m., and return approximately 4.30 p.m. I've read the book. Mrs. Prang gave it to me. Good story. Good story. No cursing in it. No innuendos. No, uh, no uh, skin. It's just a good, lovely story. Christian folks, a very good ending, so you'll be blessed. And if you can't go to the show, get the book, The Confession. Vacation Bible School, we still have needs of three people in particular. We need a teacher and a helper for the earliest, the youngest class, which are the four-year-olds, uh, and we need a helper for the five-year-olds. So if you can do that, uh, if you're willing to give it a shot, you say, well, I, th I might be able to do it, but I've never done it before. I have no experience. Well, we'll help you. Uh, and everybody has to start somewhere, right? Um, I started somewhere. I'm going to preach the main service here in a few minutes. But I remember the first time I preached, it was in a chapel in Scotland. I was scared to death. I'm a little scared right now. But I was scared to death. And I had a 10-minute had a message. And boy, that was a long 10 minutes for me. People in the congregation said, wow, we're getting out early today. You're not going to get out early today, but nevertheless, uh, <laughs> I said all that to say, you don't have to be an experienced teacher. Uh, for four-year-olds, you really don't. You just have to have a, be willing to do it. God will help you. God will help you, and we'll help you as best we can, too. So teacher and helper for the four-year-olds, and then a helper for the five-year-olds. We have a wedding coming up. You'll see that, Ryan Carr's wedding invitation. Uh, Ryan and Hannah are marrying on August 3rd at 11 a.m. in Longs Park, Pavilion Number 2. If you'd like to join the celebration, you have to respond uh, by call, email, letter, whatever, talk to her, to Mrs. Carr, Dawn, uh, by July 17th. That's what, Wednesday, Wednesday. So we'll give you a shot Wednesday night, but after that, the only way you can come is to crash it. <laughs> but bring a gift if you crash it, okay? You'll be accepted. <laughs> Family medical help. Uh, please, uh, very sober here. A member of our church family, the Pettits, recently had a medical emergency and as a result are experiencing high medical expenses. If you would like to help, if you'd like to help, God puts it on your heart to do that. If you want to help make the burden less, please put what you can in an envelope and mark it Pettit Family Medical Expenses and put it in the offering plate. I know you might not be ready this morning. Uh, I am because I got the bulletin yesterday, but if you're not, you can do it this evening or really any time. Any time at all. So there's, we're asking for help, asking God's people for help, and please, if you can, uh, make a difference there. All right. Um, break out your chorus book. Please stand. And we'll sing chorus number 12. Chorus number 12. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. I'm sorry. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. Pray for today is fine all the way, and all I need is to tomorrow. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. Turn to your neighbor and shake a hand. Brother, well, I'm Bob, <laughs> kind of fool me on that one. That's all right. That's okay. I'm nervous. Well, I know what you mean. I know the feeling. <laughs> Strength for today is mine all the way, and all I need is to follow.
One more time as you're coming back. Thy Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. Strength for today is mine all the way. And all I need for tomorrow. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. Please remain standing as the men come forward to receive our morning offering. Oh, you can limber up your wallet a little bit, okay, but remain standing. Brother Kevin Crowder is prepared to pray, and so if you would, bow with him as he leads in prayer for this morning's offering. Kevin? Dear Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the day and for the time we have to come here and hear from your word. Help us all to hear from your word. Help us to be changed by your power. Working in us, please use the offering. Give us wisdom uh, to uh, direct it in the ways that you go. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Sorry. again please and turn to hymn number 60 face to face and would you stand please together let us sing all four verses of hymn number 60 <clears throat> face to face with Christ my Savior face to face what will it be when with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me. Face to face I shall behold him, far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory, I shall see him. Only faintly now I see 
him with the darkling veil between. But a blessed day is coming when his glory shall be seen. Face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory I shall see him by and by. What rejoicing in his presence when our banished grief and pain, when the crooked ways are straightened and the dark things shall be plain, face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky. Face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by, face to face, so blissful moment, face to face to see and know, face to face with my Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who loves me so. Face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory I shall see him by and by. Thank you, and please be seated. Lori Carr is going to sing a special. Please give your undivided attention. Pray for. Uh, listen to the message, please. Make me a stranger on earth, dear Savior. Make me a stranger more like thee. Help me keep my focus on heavenly treasure, not on earthly may it be. Lord, lead me onward as a pilgrim bound for heaven, never to roam. Make me a stranger on earth, dear Savior, till I see my heavenly home. Lord, I found myself loving earthly pleasures, simple treasures, taking your place. Nothing can measure to heavenly treasures, hearing well done and seeing your face. Lord, lead me onward as a pilgrim bound for heaven, never to roam. Make me a stranger on earth, dear Savior, till I reach my heavenly home. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I was reminded in my own mind when we uh, were taking up the offering that God loves a cheerful giver. <clears throat> Notice God loves a cheerful giver. That means when you put it in the plate, or when you're about to put it in the plate, that doesn't mean you have to be cheerful all the time about it. Uh, I often wrestle at home about what I'm going to do about the offering, but once you come here, it should be settled. And then if it's settled, you can do it cheerfully. Now what about that, we mentioned a special need in the bulletin this morning, what about that? Well, like I said, God loves a cheerful giver. You can think about it, you can debate in your mind, you can complain about it in your mind, 
But when the time comes to put it in the plate, be cheerful about it. That's what God requires. It's right to give. God first gave to you. And he never asks you to give what you don't already have. That's all he asks of us. God bless you. I want you to open your Bible now for this morning's sermon to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5 is the first of three chapters, 5, 6, and 7, that we call the Sermon on the Mount. And in chapter 5, there are nine paragraphs. If you ever have to preach or teach through the Sermon on the Mount, uh, thank God that he has put it in somebody's mind in years past to already divide it up into preachable portions. And so each of the nine uh, paragraphs in, the, in chapter 5 is a preachable portion. Same thing with chapter 6 and chapter 7. Now that doesn't hold through the whole, through the whole Bible, but it does in the book of Matthew. And so I'm preaching on the penultimate portion or paragraph in Matthew 5, which are verses 38 through 42. That's our text. The title for the message, I don't title all my messages, but uh, this is important because this is what God wants you to do. The title is, Work Out Your Own Salvation. Not work at your own salvation, but work out your own salvation. So follow along as I read this eighth of nine paragraphs in Matthew 5, verses 38 through 42. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that askest thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. Oh, excuse me, I'll go one verse beyond. So the last verse, verse 42, Give to him that askest thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. How did I get work out your own salvation? Well, bear with me, and you'll see and understand. Praise the Lord. At this time in the life of Jesus and his ministry, the, there have been rumors that have been going around uh, uh, Palestine, uh, Jerusalem, uh, amongst the Jews, several rumors about the man, Jesus Christ, what he's doing, where he came from, what he's trying to do. One of those rumors is that he came to bring in a new religion. Uh, one that would change the Jews' religion. Another rumor that has been going around is his new religion was more liberal. It is easier to obey than the Jews' religion or the law of Moses. Another rumor that was going around was that when the Messiah reigns, uh, many thought that he could be the Messiah or that he was Messiah, they thought that when the Messiah reigns, the Jews will lord it over the Gentiles like they deserve and... Uh, the, the Gentiles that are being ruled over will have to obey a certain set of rules, but the rulers themselves will not have to. And so the Jews were looking forward to the setting up of the Messianic reign because they thought that they would be the lords over the Gentiles, yet they wouldn't have to obey the same rules that the Gentiles did. Isn't that just like government to do it that way? Amen. Well, he didn't come for any of those reasons. And we're, we're going to see a portion in this portion. We're going to see uh, part of the reason why Jesus came. He's exploding these rumors. He's negating them. He's saying these are all false. And he's telling them here in the Sermon on the Mount why he came. Uh, he came to bring salvation to the earth. He came to, uh, to set up, uh, actually, the Jews to be the rulers of the world. But uh, not that they don't have to obey the rules. No, they had to obey the rules. But he was given the, uh, a new new rules, or at least the understanding of the old rules, how they applied uh, for people's good, and of course for the glory of God. He's also showing them in the Sermon on the Mount that uh, they are to obey the uh, first and the greatest commandment, and the second as well. And for that I want you to turn, keep your hang, hand here in Matthew 5, turn to Mark chapter 12. He came to uh, show them that they had to obey. They were to obey. He wanted them to obey the first and the grace of commandment and the second as well. These are recorded in Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31.
Mark 12, 29 says, And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. It's also repeated in Luke chapter 10, and I ask you to turn there. Luke 10, verse 27. Luke 10, 27, And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. He is teaching also in this Sermon on the Mount that to obey the law is not just to do it or not to do it, whatever the law says, but actually to have that, as he did, written in your heart. In other words, you obey it from the heart. It's not enough. You are not a good Christian. You are not a good disciple of Jesus Christ if you just do what he said. In other words, uh, if, you, if you haven't committed adultery today, you're not a good Christian. If you haven't stolen anything today, it doesn't make you a good Christian. You're only obeying his laws, his commands, if it's in your heart not to steal. You may not steal because there's nothing to steal around available. There's nothing loosely hanging around. If that's your reason, you are not obeying the law. You're only obeying the law when you don't want to do that, when you will not do that. And that's what he's teaching us. He's instructing his disciples how to live in this present generation so as to fulfill the requirements and the purposes of God's law. What we have in the Sermon on the Mount is how the Jews in Jesus' day were to live. That's how he reveals here how he wanted them to live. And of course, they were his people. They were uh, raised up to do his will, and that will was to be the light for the Gentile nations, to lead them to a saving knowledge of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what he came to do, and that's what he's telling us in the Sermon on the Mount. Do you not know that God's salvation is unto the ends of the earth? For that, I want you to turn to Isaiah 49. Salvation was never just intended for the Jews or for any one people or for any two peoples. God's plan was always to save the whole earth. Isaiah 49 and verse 6, actually just the last half of verse 6 makes that clear. Isaiah 49 and verse 6. Reading the whole verse, but the last half is the important part and he, uh, for this message. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Judah and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation or show my salvation unto the end of the earth. That's what Jesus wanted them to do from the beginning. That's what he was telling them in the Sermon on the Mount, again, what he wanted to do. And through this sermon this morning, he's telling us that is still what he wants his people to do. That is to be the salvation or to show God's salvation unto the ends of the earth. All right, let's look now at what he said and try to see why he said it. In other words, what it means to us today. Going to the first verse of our text, Matthew 5, verse 38. This is what he said. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. Now I want, you, I want to show you that in the Bible. It's important that you know where, where that is said and how it is said in the original, uh, in the Old Testament scriptures, I should say. Go to Exodus chapter 21, and in verses 22 through 25 is the first place in the Bible it has been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. Exodus 21, and beginning at verse 22. Exodus 21, verse 22. If, a man, if men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow... He shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. 
And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. It is also repeated in Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24, verses 19 and 20. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. We're looking where it has been said. Leviticus 24, verses 19 and 20. A little background, verses 17 and 18. And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. And he that killeth a beast shall make it good, beast for beast. And if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, a blemish is a disfiguring mark as a scar, a missing eye, a missing tooth. Those are blemishes. And so if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. Breach for breach. A breach is a, a break or a gap. You know, you... A slash in the arm, for instance, a break in the skin, a gash. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. The third place it said is in Deuteronomy 19. Deuteronomy 19. Deuteronomy 19, uh, beginning at verse 16 and reading through verse 21. Deuteronomy 19, 16. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between, between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days... And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And, behold, if the witness be a false witness, and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put away the evil from among you. I believe, uh, in the first place, that God gave this law, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, as a deterrent to violence. Because certainly if, if, if a young child or a young person, for instance, was witness to this uh, law being carried out by the judges, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, uh, blemish for blemish, uh, slash for slash, whatever. If they would witness that in their young age, uh, that would probably make them think twice before they hurt somebody in their later age. And so I, I believe it was given as a deterrent. And... and I think with me you can understand, or at least to see the fairness. It's certainly not unfair. Of course, you, the guilty party will probably say, well, I didn't mean it. But still it happened. It still has happened. And do you know what, God, uh, if, you don't, if you kill somebody but you didn't mean to do it, uh, you know what they call that? They call that uh, manslaughter. Now, it's not the same as murder in the first degree, but there is... Uh, a punishment to be uh, received because of it, because a person died at your hand who didn't deserve to die. But God does take into account that you didn't mean to do it. But he's not stating that here. He's just stating eye for eye, tooth for tooth, I believe, as the deterrent. However, as you could probably be quick to point out to me, uh, this law, by the way, does not fulfill the first and greatest commandment or the second commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. Because certainly, uh, maybe the party who had received the breach or the blemish would be glad to get it, give it to the guilty person. But I don't think the bystanders would. I don't enjoy, by the way, uh, the death penalty. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't make me happy that that happens. It doesn't make me happy that God promises a hell for those who won't receive Jesus Christ as Savior. But it doesn't matter. It's still God's law. It's still the law. So he said, love your neighbor as yourself, and certainly you wouldn't want to see your neighbor, it's particularly if he didn't mean to do it, it was an accident, to receive eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Nevertheless, that's what he said here, and that's where he said it in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. You have heard that has been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. Verse 39. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, Turn to him the other also. 
Now, what about that? What's he mean here? Go to Proverbs chapter 24 and look at verse 29. Proverbs 24, 29. Behind, but I say unto you that you resist not evil. By the way, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, breach for a breach, that is resisting evil. That's revenging evil. That's paying back. That's getting even. But he goes on to say that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Okay, Proverbs 24, 29. By the way, I've heard these. These are some of the first teachings I ever heard from the Bible, what we're looking at right now. Turn the other cheek, go the extra mile. I've heard that since I was a child. But I didn't understand it. I didn't know why, except Christians did that. That's, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to do that. Well, I'm going to tell you why. And I trust that it will be a blessing to you. Proverbs 24, 29. What about this? But I say unto you that you resist not evil. Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Proverbs 24, 29. Say not, I will do so to him as he hath done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. We're not to say that way. Christian people are not to act that way. We're not to do to others as they do to us. That's what he's saying here. But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Uh, look in Romans chapter 12. You'll see the same thing put forth there. Romans chapter 12. Now we're going to get to the important part, what, why, why should we act this way? But first I want to show you what he says and then uh, give you some scriptural background so you understand what he said. And then I'll tell you why. Romans 12, look at verses 17 and 19. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And so somebody, here's how it's supposed to be. Somebody does something bad to me. They hurt me, they rob me, they do, they break my house down, they steal my car. What am I supposed to do to that? I am supposed to recompense to no man evil for evil. I'm to uh, avenge not myself, but rather I'm to give place unto wrath. What's that mean? Well, I was talking about God's wrath. In other words, you hurt me. I'm not to hurt you back. I'm to <laughs> give place. Get out of the way. Because God said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Now, I don't think I should say, sick him, God. No, that's not the right attitude. But God says, I will repay. So he's going to do it. So I'm supposed to... <laughs> Give place to wrath. Not to fight against God, but let God's will be done. But as far as me doing something, no, no, no. It's not, not in me. I'm not the judge. God is. And he says, I will. I will repay. Back to our text, verses 40 and 41. Matthew 5, 40 and 41, And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. If any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. For that I want you to go back to Romans again, same chapter, Romans chapter 12, and I want you to look at verses now. We looked at 17 and 19, now we're looking at 20 and 21. Romans 12, verses 20 and 21. If he compels you to go to mile, go with him too. Romans 12, verses 20 and 21. Therefore, if, any thy, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now look at Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22. Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22. Let 
Notice the similarity. You've just seen these words. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. You've probably heard about that heaping coals of fire on his head. Uh, back in the, uh, Jesus' time and before Jesus' time, when the Old Testament was written, of course, uh, they used to uh, uh, keep the fire alive through the winter by uh, coals. And so if, if your fire went out, it was cold and you needed some fire, you would go to a neighbor and you would ask them if you could have one ember or, or one piece of coal one ember from their fire, uh, you'd put it in a pot so it wouldn't burn real fast, and then you'd carry that home and then put it on your wood or, or whatever you had, rags, whatever you had to start the fire, and then the fire would be relit in your fireplace. And so this figure is, uh, by being kind to that person who was not kind to you, you would not be giving them one ember to start their fire, but you would actually be heaping ember upon ember, much more than they needed. And by that, of course, then they would be ashamed because of their ill treatment of you, because you treated them so well. That's the idea. And that's what we're supposed to do. As he says, if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Verse 42. Give to him that askest thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn to not thou away. Again, give to him that askest thee. Okay, Brother Smith, please give me your car. <laughs> and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. You're crazy. I'm not going to do that. Well, that's not what it's talking about. If you want to understand the Bible, you have to read your Bible. And so the Bible, of course, if it's, it's the best commentator on the Bible. And so if you want to know what that means, it's not, don't make up something in your mind. Go to the Bible and find out what the Bible means when it says it. What's it talking about? Now, I'll tell you what it is not. When I was in the Marine Corps, I, I met a fellow once who was from one of those small islands in the western Pacific Ocean or central Pacific Ocean. Now, we just had a missionary here about a month or so ago, and he was going to some island uh, to start a work there, uh, and that island, at, at high tide, the tallest piece of land, or the land sticking out of the water, the, the highest part was only 15 feet above high tide. And they were going there. So I met a fellow, a, a fellow Marine, who was one, one of those small islands, and he was going to go and leave. And he was thinking about what he was going to take to go and leave, and he was going to buy some presents, of course, for his folks and for his friends, but he wasn't going to take his boom box, he wasn't going to take his, you know, his best suit, he wasn't going to take this good, his good watch, because on that island, they have perverted, well, I say they have perverted, they actually, it's the custom on that island where this fellow is from to do that. In other words, if somebody asks you for something, you weren't to refuse it, because the Bible says that, does it not? Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow thee, turn not thou away. If he would take his best boom box to home, somebody would ask him for it. And according to the custom of the island, he would have to give it to him. He would have to give it to him. If they said, please give me your watch, he would have to give his watch. And so he didn't take those things that he wanted, didn't want to give away when he went home because that was the custom there. That's not what this is talking about. What this is talking about is revealed to us in Deuteronomy chapter 15. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow thee, turn not thou away. Well, what's that mean? Give me some examples. Okay, Deuteronomy 15. This is what it's referring to. When Jesus said it, and the original writers of the scripture when they said it. Deuteronomy 15, and we're going to read verses 7 through 11. Now notice how broad this is, but also how narrow it is. It's not just, well, hey, you have a new car, give me your car, and I have to do it because I'm a good Christian. No, 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 no. Look what it says. Deuteronomy 15, beginning at verse 7. If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in thy land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. 
But thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. Notice his need. Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him naught, and he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land. So when this was given by Moses from God, it was very narrow. It was restricted to Israel. It was restricted to the Jews. And so the land was the promised land which God promised them, the land of Palestine. Uh, their brother, of course, were their brother Jews. Uh, poor and needy. Poor is uh, somebody that just doesn't have a lot, you know. If, if you have a new car, a nice house, if you have a, a regular paycheck, a, a pension or whatever, you're not poor. Now, you may not have all you want to have, but you're not poor. A needy person doesn't really have anything to do with what they have. It has to do with what they don't have that they need. So you could be uh, a person of, you know, uh, average wealth, let's say. You, you, you have enough, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, your, your, your wife gets run over and she goes to the hospital and all of a sudden, remember you had a little nest egg in the bank, five or $10,000 saved up. Uh, that's just the first day's bill. You understand? And so the average person very quickly could be a needy person. They need something, they need it now. And what this scripture says is if they had a need, if they had a want, if they come for you to help, you're to help them. You're not to say no. Well, hey, uh, it's just about the year of Jubilee and all debts are going to be canceled. So no, I'm not going to loan you $50,000 because when the year of Jubilee comes on, it's canceled out. So no, God says, no, that's not the way it's supposed to be. You're supposed to help your brother. But he just doesn't say you're supposed to. He promised you great blessing. Now look at it again. Um, verse 10, thou shalt surely give him and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works, and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. So here's how that works. Somebody in the church has a need, you help to meet that need. You're not going to come up short. You're not going to have to skip a meal. You're not going to have to cancel your vacation. God says, I'll return it. And in other places, it's very clear, and in my experience, uh, praise the Lord, it agrees with Scripture, amen. Experience uh, is only good if it agrees with the Scripture. That agrees with the Scripture, uh, God will give you back more than you give away. That's just how it works. Just how it works. And you know what? He promised that even if you don't believe it. <laughs> All you have to do is do it. It's kind of God, God probably dares you to, tr to give. And he says, I'll give it back. He'll do it. Nevertheless, that's what he says. That's what Jesus is referring to. Uh, Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow thee, turn not away. It has to do with the need. has to do with who the person is. Here in Deuteronomy, Jew with Jew. Jesus Christ came, as you know, to show what God really meant. And it was kind of like, this is grade school of giving. This is where the Jews were supposed to start. But if they were going to be the light to the whole world, they had to really expand that same truth to include the whole world. Because who is your brother? He's that person in need. doesn't matter whether he's a Jew or Gentile. doesn't matter if he's from Lancaster County, Salanca, or where. If he's on the face of this earth, he has a need. If he is, and I'll, I'll make it more narrow, if he is your brother, we're not to turn away. All right. That's what Jesus said, but why did he say it? Or what would he have us do with what he said? And that's what I want you to understand now. Remember the Beatitudes, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount? One of them being, ye are the salt of the earth. Another and ye are the light of the world. Jesus' purposes for his disciples is higher than getting even, uh, getting back, 
justifying ourselves or others of our selfish purpose. No, God's purposes for his disciples are much higher than those things. As I said, most Christians think they've done good if they didn't steal anything today. No. If it's in your heart to steal, you're a thief. It's never good. It's wrong. Now I want you to do, I want to take you on a little scriptural journey. We're, just, we're, not, we're getting close to the end, folks. A little scriptural journey that will explain why Jesus said to his disciples to act so contrary to what people call reason. Why should you turn the other cheek? Do you know? Why does he want you to go that extra mile? Do you know? I'm going to show it to you right now. Follow along. It will become plain. First scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. 1 Corinthians 6, 7 and 8. As I say, as a little boy, I've heard that, turn the other cheek. Found it hard to do. Found it very hard to do when they struck me on the one cheek to turn the other cheek. In fact, I don't think I ever did it. <laughs> Boy, I praise the Lord, I live now, so not, not, many, not too many people are hitting me in the face, you know. But here's why. Follow along, please. 1 Corinthians 6, uh, verse 7, just the last half of the verse, which says... Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, yeah, I'm going to write chapter, verse 7, okay. Ah. Oh, I'm looking at verse 7, I'm sorry. Okay. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. So it's talking about going to law. You know, somebody... Uh, take some from you, somebody defrauds you, somebody cheats you, uh, and what the world teaches, sue them. Get it back. You deserve it. It's yours. And God says, why don't you rather take wrong? Who are you going to ruin to Jesus Christ by suing them? <laughs> That's what he's asking. Why don't you rather take wrong? Why don't you let yourself be defrauded? Well, uh, uh, I'll lose out. I'll, there'll be my things to be going on. on, on uh. Yeah, you're right. And you lose your testimony too. You'll never reach that person for Jesus Christ. You never reach that judge for Jesus Christ. You never reach that policeman for Jesus Christ. Because they'll see you a hypocrite. They'll see somebody that if that's the way a Christian acts, well, hey, that's how the world acts. Go to Philippians chapter four, verse five. Philippians four five. Why don't you rather be defrauded? Why don't you take the loss? In other words, we are. We are to act contrary to the world. We're not to go along to the way the world does things. Our purposes in Christ Jesus are higher than the world's purposes. The world gets back, get even. No, God's purposes are higher than that for his disciples. Philippians 4, verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. What does moderation mean? Well, here it means let your gentleness, let your self-control, let your patience be known unto all men, Christian people. Now, John 3.30. John 3.30. We're looking to understand why Jesus said, turn the other cheek. Why go the extra mile? Why give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow thee, turn not thou away? Why give him the other cloak, cloak also when he takes your coat? John 3.30. He must increase, notice, but I must decrease. It's my stuff, my coat they took. I must decrease. I'm not that important. God's purposes on this earth do include my happiness, my contentment, my everlasting life, but includes much more than that. And my purpose, if you're a Christian, if you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, your purpose is, is more than your particular and personal and solitary happiness. It includes other people. And of course, the plan of salvation to be heard needs a preacher, a speaker, a testimony, somebody saying it. 
And so the individual, I, must decrease. Jesus Christ, he, God, must increase. It's his purposes we're trying to serve to do, not ours. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10, and we're looking at verse 23 and following. 1 Corinthians 10, 23. First Corinthians 10.23, just the last part of that verse. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. I can sue them at the law, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Now, that doesn't mean you're, go to, you're trying to get his money. You're trying to include, increase his wealth. You're trying to make your neighbor better off than he is. You're not trying to, you're, we, you and I, as disciples of Christ, are not, try, are not supposed to try to make ourselves better off. We're to make the other person better off. You have a good idea? You have a way the fellow in escort can get a better crop, get a bigger yield? Tell him. Share it with him. Just don't keep it to yourself. And so we're to look on the, on the wealth of others, not on our own wealth. That's verse 23. Let every man seek his own, verse 24, but every man another's wealth. Verse 33, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. And then finally, Philippians chapter 2, and then we'll be done. Philippians 2, we're going to start at verse 3. Philippians 2, verse 3 and 4, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. How can I help? How can I help my neighbor? How can I help that man, that woman? How can I help them? Verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, amen, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You're a saved person? You're supposed to work your salvation out. Uh, why do I have to work it out if I'm saved? Because when you were saved, when I was saved, it's a spiritual matter and it's inside. Nobody can see it. You walk down the street as a saved person, nobody knows that. The only way they have any idea is what you do, seeing what you do, how you act. Initially, our salvation is on the inside, but that won't do anybody else any good. You're saved, but it's on the inside. The way you help other people, the way you have an influence on other people for Jesus Christ, the way you can make a difference in another person's life is to work out Put it on the outside. Work at it so that they might see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. I look at verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Notice, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. And so here's what I conclude. If you don't live a Christian life and you hold forth the word of truth, nobody's going to listen to you because you'll just be another hypocrite like they see, say they know tons of hypocrites. But if you live as Jesus tells us, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, they sue you and take away your coat, give them your cloak. They ask for your help, don't turn them away. If you live as Jesus says here in this portion of the Sermon on the Mount and you hold forth the word of life, then they'll listen to you. And they'll say, verily, uh, this is a person of God and God will speak to them. 
he will let them see his light through you. That's why Jesus said those things. That's what he wants us to do. We, Christian people, are the light of the world. And he wants our light to so shine that they'll see Christ Jesus in us. And so that's why. We should work out our own salvation. We start with our new life in Christ on the inside. Does nobody else any good? It is when we show our salvation on the outside that we fulfill Jesus' command to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Now, what Jesus has asked us to do, no, it's not easy. But we're supposed to think about it. And we're supposed to plan. You, when you get up in the morning, before you get out of bed, understand, tell God you understand that there's going to be many trials. This may be the day somebody smacks you in the face. This may be the day that somebody steals your wallet. This may be the day that somebody says, would you please help me? I need some money. And be ready for it. Already have a plan what you're going to do. I, I shared this with the church before. Uh, my daughter uh, at her church down in Georgia, she had a, a woman came there and she gave her testimony. Well, she was a member, but she gave her testimony about she, she prepared to give away money. She always kept a $100 bill in her wallet, in her purse. She never spent it. It wasn't there to spend. It was there to give. So that when on that day, at that time, in that place, somebody needed help, she would have it. She made a plan to be ready to do what Jesus asked her to do, that she might have a testimony uh, and share the word of God with people as God gave occasion. So how do you live? Are you, do you turn the other cheek? It's not easy, but it's purposeful. God has a reason for us asking to do it, and that reason is for the salvation of the world. Please bow with me as I close the word of prayer. Father, we understand, uh, but it's hard to do, and so God, I'm, I'm asking you not only to put it into our hearts, give us the understanding. I think you've done that here this morning. But Father, may you put it in our hearts, and, and, and may we each get a plan to be ready to help. Anticipate that today might be the day that I have to turn the other cheek, that I have to do right despite what happens, that I, might, that I do not revenge myself, but I give place to wrath. And Father, you said you will repay God, thank you that in Christ Jesus, we have escaped that payment. Jesus took it on himself. Thank you, Lord, for that. But, Father, you, don't, you only have us to tell other people about Jesus Christ, and we have to have a good testimony. So, Father, help us. Help us daily to have a good testimony that we can make a difference in this world, holding forth the words of the living God. I pray this with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Please stand, take up your uh, hymn book. We'll have a song of invitation. 311. 311. The purpose for this is to give you an opportunity and in a public way to acknowledge God speaking to your heart and to respond to Him. It may be that, like many Christians, like me often, too often, uh, I go through life not prepared. I don't even think about doing things like this. And so when they happen, when God gives opportunity, I don't respond. So if that's you, uh, thank God for waking you up and giving you a plan to be a better testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, do it as we sing Song 311, All for Jesus, first dance. I'm not asking you to come forward. I'm asking you to respond to God in your heart. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, all my being's ransom powers, all my thoughts and words and doings, all my days and all my hours, all for Jesus, all for Jesus, all my days and all my hours. All for Jesus, all for Jesus. All my days and all my hours. Second stanza.